Okay, we're going to go into a time of worship now. Welcome back to church. Um, let me just pray before we start. Um, dear God, just thank you for this time that we will come today on a Saturday night and just worship you and just hear um, what you have to speak to us through um, Pastor Gabriel. And also just a time to worship with the congregation. Um, just praying for your blessing and just to be able to hear your voice and to be able to focus tonight. Uh, so all this I pray in Jesus' name. So, yeah, our first song we're going to do tonight is Heart Like Heaven. And it's actually a really close, a song that's really close to my heart. And um, the lyrics that really stand out to me is in the first verse. And it says, um, if you saw perfection, uh, I die trying to reach it. But God doesn't, um, you know, require perfection. And it says, but this broken heart is all you want. And so life can be really difficult. Life can be very tiring. But just remember that, you know, right now we're just coming to God and it doesn't matter. You know, if you're complete or if you're perfect or not. You know, he just wants to see you and he just wants your heart. So let's go into the time of worship.
So our next song we're gonna do is Whole Heart. Can we just stand for the next song? Um, we only have two songs tonight, but um, this is a familiar song uh, that we've done before. Uh, it just talks about how God wants all of us and how He loves every part of us. So let's just stand for a time of worship.
Yeah, let's just pray. Um, dear God, just thank you for loving us so much and uh, giving so much for just broken people that didn't even want you. Um, and even now, uh, there's so much struggle and so much hurt, but we know that you've given more than um, we go through. And just praying that we have faith and that you give us faith uh, through tough seasons, through the pain that comes, and even through lack of faith. Um, just um, thanking you for this time of worship and even as Pastor Gabriel begins to speak just to be able to hear your voice. Um, so all this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go into a time of uh, offering. Um, there's an offering box at the back and we're going to flash some slides. physical service and people on Instagram live. Um, I'm going to be doing announcements today. Okay, so exams are around the corner. We should encourage each other during these trying times. And we are also going to be having this new initiative called Pray Along. This will be a segment on Carmel Youth Instagram where youths will take turns to lead in prayer for various prayer items. If you are interested to be part of this and serve in this area, do contact your DCG leaders. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, Pastor Gabriel will be on leave from 20th to 22nd October, so he may not respond to messages. And um, yeah, we are also having our church camp where apparently not many people are signing up for it, so please sign up for it. Yep, and um, yep, so today on our church service, we will be doing RPG Dating and Relationship Edition, where we will get dating advice from church. Yes, I did not think I would ever say that. Okay, end of announcement. Thank you, Nathan. All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening to those who are at home watching on Instagram Live. And well, it's exciting that we are finally at the last sermon in our sermon series, leading to the glory of God. I hope all of you have been blessed by this series so far. And yeah, as Nathan said, uh, if you do have questions, uh, please utilize the Ask PG platform. Uh, it's there for a reason. Uh, there's so much I want to cover, but I just cannot complete it in the certain time that we have. Okay, so utilize the Ask PG platform and yeah, get your questions answered on dating, relationship, and sex from a Christian perspective. Now, um, Alright, so last week I showed this table about the five stages of romance and my focus last week was on the first three stages, okay? So we talked about dating and the courtship phase. Today, we will look at the final phase of that five stages, which is marriage itself. Now, I'm pretty sure many of you in this room, you're not going to get married anytime soon. But nonetheless, I mentioned last week that marriage is the end of dating. And so, you have to begin with the end in mind. Okay, this is a sermon that's going to help you to begin with the end in mind, um, which is marriage, before you even start dating. So today we're going to talk about marriages, and I'd like to give us a picture of what the end of dating looks like. 
I want to convince you, I want to show you that marriage as God has created it to be is something that's beautiful, something that is really worth it, okay, and something that's worth the wait for you as well. And of course, today we're going to talk about something that's pretty sensitive as well, and that is sex. Okay? And likewise, I want to show you that sex is something that's beautiful, something that's really good, and something that is worth the wait. Okay, so sex, marriage, and union, that's what we're going to talk about today in our sermon. So may I invite all of us to stand? Let us stand and let us just commit this time to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, I just pray that you be with us today and throughout this whole sermon, be with those who are at home as well. Whatever I prepare, O oh God, use it for your glory. May your Holy Spirit just move in hearts today on this topic. Speak ever so clearly, O oh God, as you know how um, things are in this world today. Help us not to conform to the things of this world to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and help us to have our minds renewed on this topic today. I just commit this sermon in your hands. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. The end of dating is marriage. And we look at this passage last week, Mark chapter 10. So this is a passage where Jesus, he responds to a Pharisee's, uh, the Pharisee's question. Okay, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? So the Pharisees came and they tested Jesus in the Old Testament and they said, Wow, Moses permitted divorce. And Jesus answered, Yes, Moses permitted divorce, but because your hearts are hard, because of human sinfulness. But divorce separation was never in God's plan to begin with. Verse 6. To nine, verses 6 to 9. By the beginning of creation, the very beginning of time, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Divorce was never God's plan to begin with, okay? but marriage is marriage is God's plan and now divorce are involving a married couple separating that's not against the law of the land right it's, it's totally legal okay even today but what I want to emphasize is well it's not God's plan from the very beginning and marriage is God's intention for all from the very beginning in his creation for two people to be joined as one and let no man separate, right? Two becoming one. Now this is a passage that gives us God's design for marriage. Okay, so it says here in verse 7, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. In the King James Bible, verse 7 says this, and I like, I like the King James Version better here, okay? For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Okay, to cleave means to join together. Okay, and so in the marriage, there's this aspect of leaving okay, and cleaving. Now, so we're all born in families, right? So for the first half of our lives, which many of you are actually in right now, you're under your parents. Okay? Your parents, uh, your siblings are your default family. But God has designed in a way that there will come a point in time in life okay, where the son or daughter, you will leave she, she may, she or, or he or she may live her original household, her original family, and that's not a new one, a okay, completely new one. And that's marriage. Okay? Marriage is where the son or the daughter leaves his or her birth family and something new is being created with his or her life partner. So verse 8 says, the two will become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. Now, marriage is where, mathematically speaking, okay, 1 plus 1 equals to 1. Okay, that's, that's what actually the verse is trying to say. Okay, two, two separate people 
are no longer to be seen as just two separate people. Okay, but when they come together in a marriage, they are seen as one. Okay, no longer two, but one. And the word one flesh is even used to describe this, this new entity. Right? They are one body, one entity. As if like the two different people have suddenly been merged into one. That's what marriage is all about. Now, when I was writing this sermon, I was actually drinking coffee at a cafe. Okay? And I was thinking of an illustration for marriage and I was staring at my coffee cup and I realised that, wow, this is an excellent illustration for marriage itself. <clears throat> now, in coffee, you have two distinctive elements, right? You have the coffee, either coffee powder or coffee bean, and then you have hot water, okay, or water. And now, these are two distinct elements, okay? But when you merge them together, when you put them together, they become coffee. Like coffee is that one new entity that's been created for merging coffee powder, coffee beans, and water. And then in the coffee that's created, you can no longer tell apart what's the water and what's the coffee bean. And that's how marriage is like. Okay, um, two, two people becoming one. Two people becoming this one new entity, merged together like coffee beans and hot water. They become one flesh. And that's actually God's original design in creation. Okay, so marriage is not something that humans created, but something that God himself has designed to be as such in the world, right? Two becoming one. I think the key word I hope to leave with all of you today is this <coughs> union. Okay, union. So we will see today that marriage is a union and sex is also a union. And both are about two becoming one. <coughs> God is the one who designed marriage, but I think what I want to explore today is how does that actually reflect His glory? Okay, <clears throat> I'll show us two ways how marriage reflects God's glory. There are more than two ways, okay, but in the interest of time, we'll just discuss these two. And if you'd like to explore more, uh, use the Ask PG session once again. <clears throat> so God's glory in marriage can be seen in these two ways. Okay? Marriage as a complement and marriage as a commitment. Okay, marriage as a complement and marriage as a commitment. <clears throat> well, firstly, God gets his glory when men and women becomes that perfect complement for each other in marriage. Now this is what related to what we've been talking about in the past few weeks about manhood and womanhood. Like God creating men and women as equal but distinctly different from one another. And both reflect this glory. But men and women with different inclinations and different strengths. And in marriage, they come together, complementing each other. Okay? Now in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God looked at Adam, okay, the man that he has created, and he said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Probably this is still day six in creation. Okay, so God created all the plants, God created all the animals, and created Adam. I realized that hmm, something is still missing. But Adam was this single man alone. And it was said, it, it's not good. Now God has great plans in store for mankind. Right? Mankind was his crowning glory uh, created on the sixth day of creation. But he knew, okay, Adam alone, he was not going to cut it. Adam alone is not going to be able to fulfill the mission that God has for humans. So God made Eve. And Eve was the suitable helper for Adam. Now, this word helper in the Hebrew, as you can see on the slide, is the word ezer. Okay, so let's rethink that being a helper is that a very inferior role. The one that's being helped. Okay, that's how people usually see things. Okay. And so when you look at Ezra, you look at Eve's role, you know, it just seems like it's an inferior role. But that's not the case. Okay. This is actually a term Ezra is used to describe God Himself. Now in many places in the Bible we see God described as a helper. In no way is he inferior, right? This is the same word as that used to describe Eve. 
So Psalms 118 verse 7, for example, says, The Lord is with me, He is my helper. As a, Psalms 46 verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. As a, same word there. Okay? Even in the New Testament, okay, the Bible talks about God as a helper. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 6, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can male models do to me? And so there's a role of Eve that, that mirrors very much the role of God to us. And the word Ezra is actually better translated as irreplaceable help. Irreplaceable help. Okay, it's the kind of help that you know, if it doesn't come true, the entire thing will fail. Okay, that's just how important Eve's role is. Okay, irreplaceable help. And you think of this in video game terms. Okay, I don't play this game. Um, sorry. Uh, yes, okay. I don't, I don't even know what this game is. Okay? But when you play a role-playing game like Mobile Legends, I presume, okay, having played Dota a little bit, okay, that there's always a character whose role is like the carry. Okay? And then there's another character whose role is the support. And these two characters are kind of part of the same team. Okay? They're working towards the same goal, to accomplish the same mission, but they play different roles. And that is something to us that that's how marriage actually looks like. You think of the husband like the carry, okay, the one who shones forward, and then the wife is the support. The wife supplies that irreplaceable help, right, for, for the mission. Okay, not just for her husband, but for the mission that God has prepared for both of them to accomplish together. Now, this is very familiar to us, right? We talk about how in the heart of man, there's the adventure to live in the heart of a woman. She wants to play an irreplaceable role in the adventure. So marriage is that adventure that God has installed for, for married couples to live. But it's not just an adventure for them to enjoy Okay, but this is an adventure that's, the adventure that's bigger than themselves, an adventure for His kingdom. And God wants to use married couples for His kingdom. Now, God wants to use singles as well, where you are right now, God wants to use you. But there's something special okay, about married couples that God wants to, you know, to, to accomplish through them. Something that married couples can accomplish that singles can't. And so, Every married couple is like a tag team for God's glory. But marriage is where you get, you know, two people's life purposes meet. And, and two people's life purposes, they start to intertwine as one. And together, they can accomplish God's mission for both of them. That tag team mission that only can be accomplished not with one person but with two. And so marriage is about a complement, that complement for God's glory. When a man and woman complement each other to fulfill the mission that God has given for them, like a tech team, that, that's how God gets the glory. And that's how um, marriage reflects God's glory. When marriage is a complement. And the second way marriage reflects God's glory is when marriage is a commitment. Now, marriage reflects God's glory by putting on display that love is not only a feeling, but love is a commitment. You know, we live in a world today where love is celebrated mostly as just a feeling. You know, I love you, I'm with you, I no longer feel love for you, I walk away. Right? That's how many celebrity couples um, fall, in, fall in love and then fall out of love. I want to show us today that love is not only a feeling, okay? love is also a commitment. And we're going to take a look at a video, not necessarily a video, but a, a, a short little movie trailer okay, without the pictures. And in this movie trailer is a long quote about love. Can let us to just pay attention to it. And I invite Injo to play the video for us. You shall love whether you like it or not. Emotions, they come and go like clouds. Love. 
love is not only a feeling, you show love. To love is to run the risk of failure, the risk of betrayal. You fear your love has died. It perhaps is waiting to be transformed into something higher. Awaken the divine presence which sleeps in its man, its woman. Know each other in that love that never changes. Now, oh, guess what? This is a trailer video um, talk that talks about love. Uh, it's very meaningful to me because five years ago when my wife and I got married we walked up the aisle hand in hand as husband and wife with this exact same track playing in the background so I can vividly remember the scene when I took her hand and we walked up to the aisle in the front after saying our marriage vows and with this in the background right and we want I think when, when we played this we wanted to just anchor each other in truth that love is not only a feeling but a commitment emotions they come and go like clouds the feelings of romance may fade away but marital love for each other is not going to be dependent on that but love would be a choice we shall love whether we like it or not we shall love each other and that's the essence of what marriage is all about that reflects God's glory marriage is that lifelong commitment to love the other person in sickness or in health for richer or for poorer for better or for worse till death to be part that is unconditional commitment to love the other person for the rest of our lives and that, that's that's marriage that's the kind of committed love that is beautiful but as compared to that flickering love in a world that comes and goes according to feelings according to emotions it's, it's such a love in marriage is, is what reflects the glory of God because it's a picture of God's love for us as well what is what it says in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 never will I leave you never will I forsake you that's what God says to us and, and, and that's, that's, that's God's love that's constant God's love that is sure but God has committed himself to love us for the rest of our lives he doesn't stop loving us when we sin against him he doesn't stop loving us when we kind of walk away from him his love is not dependent on whether we sin or not his love is not even dependent on whether we do our quiet time or not but he has simply committed to us to love us for the rest of eternity and there's no better picture of that kind of love than marriage love as a commitment not just a feeling so john piper in his book this momentary marriage he, he says this okay marriage is for the display of christ's covenant keeping grace God gets glory when two very different and very imperfect people forge a life of faithfulness and a furnace of affliction by relying on Christ. But marriage is to display God's covenant keeping grace. He's for you. He said he will love you and he promised and he fulfills his promise. That's how marriage looks like. And that is how it displays God's love. That's how God gets the glory. Marriage as a commitment. 
it's much to explore. Um, I'm ready to move on. Now, so God's, God's glory can be seen in marriage, right? When a marriage becomes a complement for two people, and when marriage is also a commitment between two people. And with that in mind, okay, this forms the context of the next part of my sermon. We're going to talk about sex. We're going to talk about sex, okay? Now, we're not, most of you might not even notice it, okay, because it has become so much part of our everyday lives. But we actually live in a culture today that is somewhat hyper-sexualized. Okay, so all you have to do is to walk into the mall, like, or randomly scroll through Instagram. And you can probably understand what I mean. Okay, there's just so much sexualization that we see in public and online space today. So sex has been exploited in commercials to sell products, and sadly, women are the ones who are mostly exploited. Right, having a, a women model that is, is, is dressed in a revealing way on an ad seems to be a norm, seems to be very normal these days. People don't even think about it, but it's been normalized. I don't want to mention right, sex, nudity on, on movies are like just a norm nowadays. Access to pornography on the internet has never been easier in our generation. There's just so much sex in public space. But you know what is really interesting about this thing? You know that sex is never meant to be public, but private. Now, if you turn back the clock about 50 years ago into my grandmother's generation, you, you, you probably realise that this very different culture okay, from the world today. Sex is hardly found in public, but it's reserved for the private sphere. And there's some truth, I believe, found in that era that we have lost that ties into what God actually designed for sex to be. Okay, sex is good because God is the one who created sex, not Satan. But oftentimes, this thing that is good has been misused, it has been corrupted into something that is not in our culture today. And today, you know, sex has pretty much been reduced into just an activity to be enjoyed, a game to be played, or even a symbol to be flaunted. But that's not exactly what God intended for sex to be. So let's look at what God has designed for sex to be. Now, God has designed for sex to be for marriage and within marriage. He designed for sex and marriage to be actually connected each other and not separated. Okay, the two shall become one flesh. That's speaking about marriage, that's also speaking about sex. Okay, the two are connected to one another. And so the key word for today's sermon, as I've mentioned earlier, is union. Both marriage and both sex are union. And let it show us how sex only makes sense, okay, it only makes sense in the context of marriage and not without it. At the same time, that's the only way it can actually reflect God's glory. But sex is meant to reflect God's glory. Once again, I don't have a lot of time. Um, I just want to show us just two ways how we reflect God's glory. There are more than, more than two ways, obviously, but just two ways from today. Now, sex reflects the glory of God when it is about a permanent union and mutual belonging. Permanent union and mutual belonging. Okay, these are pretty deep things, so try to follow. Okay? Um, and these are the two things that can only take place within the confines of marriage and not outside of it. Now, you know, in, the New, in the New Testament, there's a word, there's just one word that kind of defies all forms of sex outside the confines of marriage. And the word is porneia. Okay, so in some, in some parts of the Bible, uh, you find this word translated into, into sexual immorality. Okay, and in other versions, um, you, you'll see that this word is translated into the word fornication. So sexual immorality, fornication is the same word, porneia. And it literally covers everything okay, pertaining to sex that's outside of marriage. And that's where we actually get the root word for porn. Okay? That's where the root word comes from. 
And I only look at pornea as this misuse of God's gift for sex. Pornea reduces sex into two things that is not temporary pleasure and selfish lust. Okay, pornea reduces sex into two things that is not temporary pleasure and selfish lust. And these are actually the two opposite of what sex is. Okay, if you get what I'm trying to say. But pornea, it does the opposite of what sex is meant to do, what God has designed sex to be. Okay? So let's, let's take a look at this passage in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. And from here, I'd like to draw a distinction between uh, pornea and what God has created sex to be. Okay, verse 13 it says, um, Paul, Paul speaks to the Corinthian Christians, Food for the stomach, food is for the stomach, and stomach is for food. God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, that's pornea, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Verse 15, okay? Do, not, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body, for it says the two will become one flesh. Verse 18, flee from sexual immorality, once again pornea. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. Now in this passage, Paul makes this very startling revelation about sex, which gives us actually the case against pornea, or sexual immorality. Okay, he says this in verse 16. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For he says the two will become one flesh. Remember, two united into one. Like Paul, Paul says here, but that, that's actually what still happens okay, when you engage in pornea of that sex outside of marriage. You are uniting yourself with the other person that you are enjoying sex with and the two shall become one flesh. In other words, there is a uniting function in sex. But sex is about union and that goes actually beyond temporary pleasure. Okay, every sexual act is an act of union with another party. So one can form that union with whoever or whatever one engages in sex with. Okay, whether it's a real person, same gender or not, on an object or just an image on a computer screen, one forms a union with whatever or whoever one engages in sex with. Okay, so this is, this is what this person is trying to say. And a union is more than just a physical union, it's an emotional and also a spiritual union. And so this is where sex is not this temporary pleasure act just to be enjoyed. Because something is forged. Right? Sex is meant to, to forge this permanent union between two persons, united to each other in body, heart, mind and soul. So in this sense, okay, it's in this sense that sex can only glorify God in the confines of marriage. Because marriage is where two becomes one flesh. That's God's original purpose and design for sex. It's meant to be for a permanent union and not for temporary pleasure. Now how does that reflect His glory? How does this, this, this about sex reflect His glory? It does in a way where we are meant to be united with Him. You know, that's actually the spiritual truth that, that sex is meant to convey. Right? Um, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Right? But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Right? This is the same verse okay, from the whole passage that we read earlier. We are united with God and one with him in spirit. Romans 6, 5 says, For we, if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection. 
children like this. So we are united with God, we are one with Him forever. We notice the, the parallel here. Never will He leave us or forsake us, right? Hebrews 13, 5 says. Why? Because He is united with us, we are united with Him forever. And that's how sure okay, God's relationship with us actually is. That's how secure your salvation in Christ is. You are united with God, with Him. And that's the truth that God wants you to see reflected in sex. That it's about a permanent union, not a temporary one. God is not one who uses us for His pleasure temporarily. But he, he unites with us permanently. He's here to stay with us as in a relationship in a marriage. And so this is how sex reflects the glory of God, right? When it's a permanent union, not a temporary pleasure. Now, secondly, sex reflects the glory of God when it's about mutual belonging and not selfish lust. So in other words, sex is actually not about taking, okay? It's about giving. It's also not about ourselves but it's about the other person. Where do I get that in the Bible? We continue one chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 to 4. It says, Now for the matters you read about, it is good for men not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since pornea, sexual immorality, is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise, the wife to her husband. This marital duty is sex. Okay, so pay attention to what verse four says: the wife does not have authority over her own body, but use it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but use it to his wife. That's that's in the context of sex. Okay, and so sex is about yielding ourselves okay to the other person. Even to the point that says the wife and husband does not have authority over their own body, but it's for the other person. Can you imagine that? that saying that my body is not my own, but yours. It belongs to you. It's, and that, that's about mutual belonging. What is spiritually mine, I now give it to you. I am yours. And that's very different from what I described earlier in Pornia, where sex is enjoined for the purpose of selfish lust. But God has intended for sex to be for the other person. But Pornia, sexual immorality has reduced sex into the, the, the opposite, right? Selfish lust. Instead of being for the person, it is it is becoming selfish. It's for me. Okay? So in Song of Songs, right, this whole Book of Romance in the Bible that I talk about. I love this verse, okay, it appears actually twice. First in chapter 2, verse 16, it says, My beloved is mine and I am his. And it says again, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. Repeated twice in this book. But both of these verses are declarations of mutual belonging. I am yours and you are mine. Doesn't that sound familiar? From the lyrics of the song, Oceans. That's how the last line of the chorus goes, right? I am yours and you are mine. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Right? That's how, that's how, that's, that, that's how it's meant to, how sex is meant to reflect the glory of God. Right? So in a marriage, a couple belong to each other. They are each, they belong to each other. And that's a, that's a glorious truth, actually, that we also mutually belong to God. And once again, this is actually how close our relationship with God actually is. Okay. Can you imagine that? Not only do you have a permanent union with God, you're united with Him, but He's yours. God is yours. You want to let that sink in for a bit. It's not just saying that you are God's. God is yours. God belongs to you and you belong to Him. 
That is a pretty mind blowing truth. Right? And, and to clarify, this doesn't actually mean that you get to control God. Okay? When God is yours, it doesn't mean that you get to control God. That's not what I'm trying to say. Okay? But what it actually means is that He belongs to us and He, God, is our possession. And that means even if you have nothing in this world, even if you don't have good grades in your school, even if you're not rich like others, you're not popular like others, you have one thing, which is a prized possession, and that's God Himself. That's what I'm trying to say. Right? We have the greatest one in the whole universe on our side. He is yours. And therefore, we do not have to live our lives without Him. He's for you, He will be good to you, He's united with you, and you belong to Him as He belongs to you. This is the beauty of what sex is trying to reflect in the glory of God. And so, sex reflects this glorious truth of mutual belonging to another. In marriage, it's about living for another. It's about yielding to another. And so, I'm not sure whether you have um, seen a movie where the guy goes to a girl and says, I live for you. I live for you. Whatever is mine is yours. That's real. That ought, ought to be met, lived up in our lives. It's all about giving, not taking. And that's 180%, 180 degree opposite from pornea, which is all about self satisfaction all about selfish pleasure. And so in a grander sense, sex reflects the truth that we mutually belong to God. We are His and His ours. So in summary, I'm done for today. Right, we talked about marriage earlier, how it reflects the glory of God, where men and women complement each other in God's mission. And secondly, marriage reflects the glory of God when it's about the commitment to love. This is how God is committed to love us, whoever we are. He's there to the end. And essentially, both sex and marriage, they're about a union of two people becoming one. And so they have to be seen together. Right, so sex makes no sense outside the confines of marriage. But it reflects God and the glory of God when there's concepts of permanent union and mutual belonging. That's what sex is about. It's not for temporary pleasure and it's not for selfish lust. It's for the other person. It's not temporary, it's permanent. And so today I'm going to close um, by inviting us to meditate on the words oceans. And as you meditate on this, I, I hope that you, you gain um, a new perspective in this song. That God is with you. God is not far from you. He's as near to you as a married couple, if you are a married couple with Him. You know, as He calls you out upon the waters into the great unknown, whatever that is, he is close to you and He will never fail you because He never leaves you nor forsakes you. You are His and He is yours. Let's meditate on the words of oceans together. God, we thank you for our relationship with you. It's a relationship that is closer than ever. You have united us with you. You are with us You've committed to loving us. And Lord, we are fallible human beings. We sin, we walk away from you. Lord, I just want to utter a prayer for those who have sinned in this area, oh God. Lord, I just pray that they will come to you to find that forgiveness, that overwhelming love, that stems from you once again. Lord, we live in a culture which is pulling us in a direction where that's not pleasing in your eyes in this area of sex and marriage. But Lord, I just pray to continue to see things through your eyes, through the one who loves us so much, through the, through the eyes of our Creator God, the one who has created all things for good. Wherever we are, O oh God, we want to walk back to you. We want to walk back to the one 
who loved us with such a committed love, the one who loves us even when we sin, even when we choose to walk away, because you are committed to us, you never leave us, nor forsake us. So Lord, I just pray for healing, come upon those who have sinned sexually. God, may you restore them, because you are committed to them. You never let them go. You desire that they walk back to you. And now you've received God's benediction. May the God who loves you with a committed love, whom you are united to, grant you the power and the grace to walk a life that is pure and holy in His sight. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, please be seated. And service is now over. God bless all of you, and have a good night. Bye-bye.